Hello, everybody. Welcome to Storytime with Dutch. And for the first time ever in the history of this show or this program, it's not going to be just me and James talking back and forth. We're actually going to have a guest today. And his name is none other than the good doctor, Tom Pritchard. Tom, how are you today? Hold on. I want to make sure I got this straight. I, I'm the first ever guest on Storytime yes. with Dutch. Is that yes. right? Yes, well, first I, ever. Okay, well, I, I, I understand from James that I was one of the first guests he had that did over five viewers. Just so you know. Really? Yes, yes. I was well, so I, I can't expect. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Or, may, or maybe it was less than five viewers. One of those two. I'm not sure. Well, so if you had, say, more than seven that would mean I will have more than eight, maybe, All right. because you're, you're already known to the audience and you already got over with them. So anyway, Tom, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. I mean, I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a little bleary eyed today uh, outside, but but I'm doing absolutely great. We have the JPWA, and I'm sure if you're familiar with the Jacobs Pritchard Wrestling Academy, but we've been doing that for four years. In January, we'll start our fifth. And uh, I'm doing that five days a week, Dutch. It's, uh, uh, it, it can be mind-numbing sometimes, but it can be very rewarding other times when you see people go out and do what they want to do. Well, I remember when you opened it, you and, you and Glenn, and I said, that will do good. That will do very, very good up in, up in Knoxville, and, and I was glad to see you open it because how many wrestling schools have you seen that somebody needs to be training the trainers? Well, they didn't, they didn't do anything in wrestling, but yet are trying to train a whole class of, of kids and they don't even know what they're doing. Well, that's because they've never seen it and they know only what they've seen and only, only what they uh, watch on TV. And, and they think if, if, if they can watch it on TV, they can do it and figure it out. And nobody's actually taking the time. The, the days of having a veteran take you in the ring and uh, teach you uh, actual during a match, you know, uh, uh, on the job training doesn't exist anymore. And really, that's yeah. the way you learn. And that's the way I learned. And that's the way, uh, um, like stand up comedy, you have to learn, but you also have to see great comedians and great performers to, to at least uh, steal from and, and commit larceny and, you know, yeah. And you make it your own because originality is highly overrated, man. You know that it, it, you uh, gotta, of course it is. Yeah. You, you got to go out there and, and take something and then, then you develop your own style and things like that. But these guys don't, don't even have a clue because they're watching other guys who, who don't have a clue. And, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but a lot of guys now don't work for the fans. Right. They work for the other, <laughs> for the, they work for the other guys. See, they don't work for the fans, the 10 or 12 that come in. They work, for, they work for the dressing room and they go back and they say, wow, man, I love that move you did. Even though you fell and broke your neck or yeah. broke your leg off that dive from the top rope. So if you don't work for the fans, you're not going to get a reaction. You can't well, hear that dressing room reaction. No, well, that's 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 true. I, I just think that uh, um, it's I I don't want to beat everybody over the head either. But it's a different business, different day. You don't give era, a crap. Different, you'll beat yeah. him. You you. Oh, I will, the man. When he's down, you don't I, care. I'll Tom. put the boost. See, you're right. I don't. But I'm trying to learn <laughs> how to. I, I have made so many people cry without even trying. And, and then I realized that's not the point of a coach. That's not a point of a trainer. You know, you, you got to give encouragement and then it's up to them to take it. But at the same time, we can't blame the guys for being born during the era they were born. You know, if they were born during, uh, the cartoon era and all that stuff, when, when things were really going to the extreme, well, okay. And then, then the other guys who were born in the Attitude Era got to see the guys who grew up on the wrestling that, that you and I understand and, and grew up in. You know, that's the stuff they liked. So so, give, me, give me the name of your wrestling school again. It is the Jacobs Pritchard Jacobs Wrestling Pritchard. Academy, the JPWA. And give us a number for that in case somebody would like to call and well, check it out. Well, first and I highly all, advise it, really. Don't call, but go to the website, jpwrestlingacademy.com. <laughs> we don't we don't have a phone. You don't I, answer I, the phone. 
No. I get all <laughs> kinds of people say, call me, I want to be a wrestler. So, yeah. No, you need to either apply and show up. Because the guys who do and want to do this are going to do it. And the guys who talk about it are all just going to talk about it. That's how yeah. I feel. Uh, well, how's your, how's your brother Bruce doing? Hey, Bruce is doing good, actually. But he, he came over, came off a shoulder surgery. He's got his rotator cuff uh, fixed uh, back in the summer. Yeah. And I just talked to him. Well, I talked to him. I guess it's been three weeks ago now. They're they're over overseas right now, I believe, getting ready to go to uh I think the big show Saturday. You but getting it, ready to go they going to Ukraine? That'd be a good place to go right now. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, I yeah. think while you rest yeah. a big bomb drop, boom. Yeah. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Well, Bruce well, looking forward to it. So you know. Okay. Tom, you were known for the majority of your career as Dr. Tom. What medical school did you graduate from? Well, Dutch, I, I'm not sure if you, I, I don't know if you were there in Alabama when. Uh, and, that, and that's where I met you for the first time was in Continental, right? In Alabama. No, it was in Tennessee because I came in for, I'll tell you the story. You, you don't remember this, I guess, huh? Because I, I showed up for uh, the first night I, I, I got to the Mid-South Coliseum. And for Dundee versus Lawler, loser leave town, and all the heels and baby faces came out and sat on the front row. Yeah. That do you remember that? I remember that. Okay. That night you rode back with me from Memphis to Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's yeah. where I met yeah. you the first time. Yeah. So 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 but but in Continental, no, I met you the first time in Tennessee. It was it was okay. uh yeah, so that's that's where that. Well, let me ask you another question. You broke your foot or you broke your ankle somewhere and you were continuing to wrestle. Where was that? Well, I'm, I'm, it was actually in Louisville, Kentucky, when uh, Pat Rose and I were wrestling as the Heavenly Bodies when Dundee was booking. He had just come back from Louisiana. I, yeah. got, I came back from portland i'll tell you the whole story real quick if you have time it's, it's story time with dutch oh <laughs> uh, we got uh, all we got all day i know and, and and james is very good at editing i'm sure but but the thing was uh i i came to visit from uh portland i came home for christmas in houston dundee had been booking the rock and roll at midnight you were there uh uh terry taylor and a bunch of other guys I happened to come to Houston, talk to Bill, and I just said, hey, I've been in Portland for a year. If there's any opening coming up, man, I'd love to come in. <laughs> Realizing they're at the end of the run, like you guys had that huge run and everybody had been popping. And uh, So anyway, Bill, <laughs> yeah, I, I know now Now it's on the downslide. Uh, so Bill called me because everybody else is leaving, so I, I get in and um, uh Bill Watts turned me heel because I, I was I was insane back then. I'm insane now, but it was a different kind of insanity. And uh, Pat, Pat Rose and I, um, we knew each other, but we weren't really a team. Bill just booked us because he needed a crew to go to Memphis because he was taking yeah. over the book. And as you know how that works. And so Pat and I came in, and uh, we were working with the Fantastics. We needed a name, and Bobby Fulton, someone that came up and says, why don't you call yourself the Heavenly Bodies? Well, we did. So we worked an angle with the Fantastics and the Fabs, and uh, it was in Louisville, Kentucky. Stan came over and knocked me off the apron. I heard my ankle snap, actually. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And I had to go down those two flights of stairs. Oh, yeah. Louisville. Got back. I didn't know I broke it. But I knew I was hurting. And I was with Billy Travis, Juan Reynosa, Taurus Bulba, yeah. Wendell Cooley. No, I was, well, Wendy Cooley and I, he, wouldn't, he didn't ride with us that night, but it was, uh, it was Billy, Taurus Bulba, and myself. But Wendell Cooley, Taurus, Billy Travis, and I lived together to Days Inn off Raleigh Parkway, that hellhole. And uh, <laughs> that's so, an upgrade. So, that's an so upgrade. It, yeah, it was an upgrade. Well, from the Congress in, it was. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so 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 we we got beer and did whatever we did, you know, on the way home and got to the hotel. And uh, I said, can I sleep on the couch tonight? Because I didn't want to go in the bedroom and all that stuff. So 
The next night was Evansville. Somebody taped up my ankle. The next night was Spot Show, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, back to Monday. Then we're back in Louisville the next Tuesday. And my my foot, my leg had turned black. No, I my remember foot. it. Okay. Well, then Dundee, I remember, came in one of those rooms. So, hey, mate, you want, want to get that checked out? Well, Sherry Martell was our manager at that time. And she, she had a roommate named Tina, who was a nurse. And she said, I'm going to come by the hotel tomorrow, pick you up. And I'm going to take you to the hotel. It won't cost you anything. Tina will get you in and out. Of course, they x-rayed me. She said, yeah, it's broke. They put me in a cast right there. And, of course, back then, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. And we weren't getting paid a whole hell of a lot back then anyway. <laughs> well, we got so, paid weekly. Weekly. Yeah. We, very, very weekly. weekly. Very yes. weekly. Thank you very much. Hey, try the video, boys. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, um, I'm in the cast. Sherry says, we're going to come get your stuff. And you stay with me and uh, Tina. So I came over to their house and Tina brought a bunch of uh, scrubs from the hospital for me to wear. So I didn't have to wear jeans or anything. They took care of me for about two weeks. And I said, man, I can't live off these guys. They're not making much money either. And they're, they're making me dinner and being very nice and taking care of me. But my dad and a buddy of mine drove up to Nashville so my friend could drive my car back. Came back to Houston, and uh, it was like six weeks off. Brad Armstrong called me and said, hey, are you going back to Tennessee when you're well? And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. He said, How'd you, how would you like to come to Pensacola? And I said, oh, my God, that'd be great. Yeah. And uh, so I went to Pensacola, uh, you know, just getting back in the swing of things. Met Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden for the first time. And as you know, Dutch, my social skills mm -hmm. back then were, were sorely lacking for whatever reason. I've, I've psychoanalyzed this forever. I can't explain why I was the way I was. <laughs> but, oh, my God, looking back, I know I, I just – it was this, this social ineptness that I had. And uh, Robert and Jimmy, though, knowing you know how they are, and oh, my uh -huh. God, and it was just a fun time. It was great. Well, I don't know if you were there during this time or not, but Robert had this friend, uh, and you know Jody Hamilton, right? Yes. Well, his friend's name was Joe Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they looked similar in, in uh, you know, physique and looks and things like this. They actually, their birthdays were two days apart. And I know this because Jody, the assassin, was held for three days in Puerto Rico because they ran his passport. It was similar, and they kind of, and he was, anyway. So Robert's <laughs> friend was riding with Jimmy and Robert to the towns, and they get to talking. He wants to be on wrestling. He wants to be involved. So they do the angle where they, in Boutwell Auditorium, where uh, Dr. Love, Comes down to ringside. He ties Tommy Rich's feet to the bottom. That was, that was the Joe Hamilton. That was the Dr. Joe Love. Hamilton. Dr. Love. Yeah. Well, so he beat, they beat the hell out of uh, Robert or uh, Tommy and Johnny. And then they go to the interview stand with Gordon Solon. And they say, Gordon, this is our cut man right here, Dr. Love. You see, we did those boys. Ain't nothing going to happen to our pretty faces. We ain't going to get cut up because Dr. Love is here and Nice big picture, Dr. Love on TV, and it's an angle, and oh, my God, it's on fire, going to draw millions and all that stuff. And the next week, it's on TV, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Robert gets a call from the FBI saying, hey, who's that guy you were with? <laughs> We've been looking for him. He's on the FBI's <laughs> 10 Most Wanted. And nah. Rob said, yeah. Really? Story. Yes, for real. He, you don't you don't remember this guy? I remember something about it, but well, he 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 enjoyed um, snow in the North Pole a lot. Yeah, the Devil's yeah. Dandruff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and that I got was it. okay. I got it. I got so it. So that was it. And he was he was he was a wanted man. So Robert says, "Oh, he's just one of those guys that come around every now and then." So Jimmy and I and Robert. And I think Jerry Stubbs might have been in there, too. We're in Robert's van riding to Panama City. And Robert's talking about this angle. And I'm wearing some of the, the uh, scrubs that Tina gave me. And uh, as we stop at the 7-Eleven, get a drink, I get out. And Robert turns around, sees me in those doctor scrubs and says, boy, you can be our doctor. Yeah. 
the the booking decisions that happen on the road. Oh yeah, Robert yeah, so Robert I, Robert was great, <clears throat> and Jimmy, yeah. and you you couldn't help but have a good time in Continental. Oh my god! Everybody was friendly. Everybody was was drinking, having a hell of a time. You go to a match sometime, a hundred people out there, nobody cared. We just let's just go have a good time. Well, I'd ride. And I'd it, ride. it was it was great in Pensacola when I was there. Then you yeah, were there too, but it, it yeah. was very very fun to work there. I I, so, I would sh I would show up really. I'd show up five minutes before bill time, be on first, and can you do ten? Go out and do ten fifteen, come back, and that was it. Put your boots on, do your stuff, come back, and then go home. Yeah, take off. Uh, let me ask you something. You worked, you worked Memphis, and you worked Pensacola, which is called Continental. And you worked Los Angeles. That's when you first started, correct? Yes, yes. And and that is that's a territory that you don't hear that much about, especially anymore. For good reason. A lot of guys didn't go there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you worked Smoky Mountain. Mm -hmm. So sure. let's talk about Smoky Mountain just a minute. You worked for Jim Cornette. Does he have an explosive temper or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you you knew Jimmy a, long, a little before I did because I met Jim in, in Memphis too during my first run. That was, uh, or was, yeah, it was the first one, I think, or, or might have been the second. Uh, it was right before he and Midnight went to uh, Louisiana. But yeah, Jimmy has always had that explosive temper well as long as i've known him anyway and i think he's a smart guy he really he is. is a smart guy uh but taking things to the extreme i believe is a sign <laughs> of genius uh in a lot of people you know because they are so meticulous and and but you you know what i used to tell him right what i said Check your blood sugar levels because I think he has, he, does he have diabetes or he has, so he, but anyway, it runs high. And when he runs high, especially when he gets hungry, yeah. oh, he's, he's insane. I pulled him off a guy in Smoky Mountain when I was doing the commentary there. He had a guy that all he was doing was dragging the cables for the camera. And yeah. he got mad at him and choked him out up against the wall. I said, Jimmy, stop, 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 please. Yeah. That son of a bitch, I'll kill that. I said, Jimmy, come on, calm down. Yeah. I, I mean, hair trigger temper. And yeah. He, and he'd be sitting there and all of a sudden he'd just go off. Yeah. I yeah, love he, Jimmy to death, but my God, he just, uh, he needed to change that attitude just a little bit. And it's a wonder, I've, I've said this many, many times, it's a wonder Jimmy hadn't been shot or something. Or hitting the head with a baseball bat or something. Yeah, yeah. He, he's too much. That, yeah, but but that's what makes him him. Uh, without that temper, without that that uh, um, <laughs> fire, he's not he's not the same guy. He's oh. he's got everything the way he wants it. He's he's, he's got to have ADHD or whatever it is. We have to have everything in line, and he, he knows what he wants to do. I'm going to call deviates. him and tell him. I'm going to call him and tell him you said that, and I'm going to okay. send him. But I'm going to send him a tape of this too, just in case there's some kind of discrepancy on what I said. Well, I, let me I ask mean, you this. Uh, okay, you were in Smoky Mountain, uh, and but later on you were in WWE with the Body Donnas, correct? Mm -hmm. And you were Body Donna Zip. Yes. And they had Body Donna Skip, which was uh, Candido. Candido. And you had your most beautiful, loving person in the world as your Gorgeous. manager. Yeah. Sonny. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, as I can recall, you didn't get along too well with Sonny, did you? Well, Dutch, <laughs> I don't know if that's the, the right ex ex explanation or the right description, but no. And we didn't. I didn't get along. Look, yeah, I didn't get along with Sonny. She didn't get along with a whole lot of people unless you could do something for her. Uh, yeah. And she's always been. She's always been uh, about her. So you think? She, no, it was I know. all about Sonny. It, it was all. Well, you know, she's she's cooling. Sonny. She's cooling her heels right now, and yes, in jail. 
Right. I just just had a conversation with some some other uh, people about her, and uh, uh, it's amazing if you look at it. And and I have because man, I knew her when when she was in Memphis because her and Chris went to Memphis. That's where I first met him during one of my few stays runs there. Mm-hmm. And um, there were young kids, you know, I've noticed since she was like 18, 19 years old. And then when yeah. she came to Smoky Mountain, she was doing, she was going to college and Cornette saw her as this cute little girl. And, oh my God, we could do something with her. And maybe, uh, you know, the guys would see her. And of course, pretty little girl been told how beautiful she is her whole life. And man, she, she ran with it. And I, it, you got to think. And I've asked my again. I go. I've looked back and psychoanalyzed a lot of other stuff too. Um, when you're that young, being told how great you are all the time, or how pretty you are, and you're the most mm-hmm. beautiful woman in the world, and you know, how did not everybody handles that real well? And then she goes and gets. Well, how did you? Man. How did you handle it when they told you you was the most handsome guy in the world? You well, handled it a lot I, differently, though, right? Yeah, I did. I I had my uh, uh my maid usually answer the door <laughs> and wash my back. So, but that was that that was, that, that was a special time. I, I never let her wash my shoulders, but I let her go down a little. Anyway, she she was a nice woman, but but uh, she she made a horrible fried bologna sandwich. Well, you know, <laughs> Sunny was driving, and I think it was in Florida. Yeah. And she was drinking, as she always does. And then she hit a guy in the back. He was 75 years old and killed him. And she's, I think she actually thinks that she's going to get a limited amount of time on that. Yeah. I think this is her third DUI in the state of Florida, which the law states she's supposed to get 10 years minimum. So she may be cooling her heels for quite a while when that trial happens. I, I don't think she'll see the light of day. I mean, if you look at her record, and I said this a while back, I said this on a few interviews, that uh, something bad is going to happen. And when you go to rehab or you, you, you get sent away, they tell you it's jails, rehab, and death. Yeah. Um, there's no... There's no escape unless you in in the rehab is recovery. You never get out of recovery. You're you're always in recovery. And that's why you have to go to these meetings and you have to keep your your regimen up because you have to change people, places, things. And she never did. She'd go to rehab and I don't know if she's had six stints or what. And six stays. I, I, I believe rehab. maybe six. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it could be more. And I know, I think and I, I'm not, I don't know facts here, but I'm, I know it's been multiple. We'll never let uh, facts get in the way of a good story. I know. Yeah, just uh, make it up as you go. <laughs> right. I get it. Uh, but, but you know, there are some poor, unfortunate souls who, who just can't change. I mean, there's just because and she's well, one of them. She's one of them. Certainly yep. is. Uh, they, they, they have all these, if you know anything about AA uh, and the meetings, and it's not about mm-hmm. medication, it's about changing your attitude. It's about changing your way of life. It's about changing habits. It's about changing all these things. And she never got away from those habits, never got away from those people or places. How is she supposed to change? Nobody held her accountable. Nobody would come pick her up, say, we're going to a meeting as much as you hate them. You're going to go and sit and you're going to talk and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to do this because this is the only thing that's keeping you from that. If you're not here, then you're going to be there. So we're going to make Mm -hmm. sure. And nobody was doing that for her. She had nobody to do that. Well, Tom, let me ask you about an incident that happened in Smoky Mountain. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but I, I found it a, a, a great story. It was a story for you and Tracy Smothers one night on the highway, which was instigated by uh, Ricky Morton. And you pulled, you was in one car, Tracy was in another one. And I think Ricky Morton said, why don't we just stop here and settle this once and for all. And you stopped the cars, you got out, you had a few words, then you started fighting. And then the police car pulled up. Kind of well, tell us that story, run through it real quick. 
Well, what happened, what actually brought this what, on. What was the beef about? I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> we, we, do you remember Smoky Mountain when we did the deal with WCW? We went, Maybe. we went, okay, well, uh, w, Bill Watts was, was with WCW at the time. Jimmy had uh, worked a deal where we would go over and do some TV for them and switch talent. Okay. Yeah. Well, we did a deal on TV with Rock and Roll. We did Fall Brawl, okay, for that match, but Watts left before that. After we did that, uh, uh, I got we we got a call from WWE. Said, "Hey, would you guys like to come do a match at SummerSlam with the Steiners?" Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the brightest bulb on the on the tree, but I understood what what we were doing in Smoky Mountain Dutch, you know. Yeah. And, and you've been around for for a couple minutes too. We weren't setting the world on fire. It's not like we're drawing these record houses like Rock and Roll and Midnight did. And when you guys went, when they went to Louisiana and, and Dundee brought the crew and you and, and yeah. it was hot shotted and you guys did it and boom, that wasn't necessarily happening. We were doing okay, but it wasn't a uh, stellar business. So I understood they needed Cornette. And then for whatever reason, Jimmy's a valuable asset in professional wrestling. No matter where he goes, he's a valuable Ooh. asset. As hot headed as he is, that's what makes him tick. Uh, well, anyway, so we go, and, and it's supposed to be a one-off against Steiners. Well, then we get another match, and then we get Survivor Series against Rock and Roll in Boston. And <laughs> we're coming back after Thanksgiving, and Ricky, Robert, and Jimmy and I, uh, I, I think it was Ricky's car or Robert's car, whatever it was, but we were all going to ride together from the airport. You know, we can grab some, some food at Cracker Barrel and then go to the town that night. And this had been during a spurt where, and you remember Brian Lee? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember him. <laughs> yeah, I could forget him. Uh, but Brian and I were riding together at the, that time. He would stay with me occasionally and when he was in Knoxville on this end and everything else. And Tracy had been potatoing people, and and, and just accidents happened, and Tracy was a little but, bit. Explain uh, potatoing. Knocking the living hell out of people. <laughs> I mean, he split Brian's I call eye it open. Watermelon. Yes, watermelon. <laughs> he, he, Brian's eye was out to here, and to other people. He just he was he was he was on a roll there of just uh, hitting, you know, just things happening. And I would, you know, prior to this, when we were all living in Nashville, uh, we would get a van and drive to Knoxville for the for the Smoky Mountain stuff because we all hadn't moved to Knoxville yet. And I would kind of poke the bear with Tracy. You know, I'd play, be a smart ass. And, and, and Ricky told me one time, he says, you know, that boy is going to go off on you one day. I said, no, he knows I'm playing. Anyway, we're coming back from Survivor Series, <laughs> and we're talking in the car. And Ricky said something about Tracy. And I said, Tracy is a friggin' idiot, and you can quote me. <laughs> so, a friggin' so, idiot. Uh, well, I didn't say friggin', but you I said was, another word. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm trying to keep it so you guys don't have yeah. to do too much editing. All right. Uh, but, but, and then we keep doing our deal and laughing and bullshit. And we get to the town. Now, I'm riding back with Brian that night, and uh, Jimmy's catching around with somebody else, and Ricky and, and Tracy or whatever. They're, they're, they're fixed. Get in the locker room. Everything's cool. And then, Brian goes, it was a battle royal that night, but Brian goes out and works with Tracy first, and we're all there out there watching the matches. And, and Tracy's not, he's pissed, and he's pointing back. He's looking at me, pointing, going like. <laughs> from the ring. Yes, from the ring. And I go, oh, geez. Were the fans looking at you? Well, the fan didn't know what he was pointing at, but once he did, th there was a couple people, but it wasn't, it was more, you know, you, Tracy. Yeah. They didn't know what he was doing. I didn't. I knew what he was doing, but he wasn't working. He was hot, and and uh, Jimmy was at ringside with Brian. And we come back, and Brian goes, "I don't know what the hell was wrong with him." I said, "I do, I know," yeah. and I told him. I said, "I said what I said in the car." And I'm sure Ricky told him. We all go out for the battle royal. So now, Ricky stooged you off. Oh hell! <laughs> you find that bastard. hard to believe. Yeah, I know. Doesn't sound like Ricky, uh, but. 
so we get to the battle royal, and I'm ready to be the martyr and just say, look, let him hit me. <laughs> let him get it out because he'll feel better. He'll feel better, but he'll feel bad the next day, and yeah. I'll have – I'm ready for that. Well, all the boys are grabbing him, and I'm saying, let him go. Let him get it out of his system. They said, no, no, no. They pulled the battle royal, pulled him out of the battle royal. It was all screwed up. It was a horrible night. So I'm riding back with Brian. He's driving. We stopped, got beer, whatever we did. And we pass Ricky and Robert on the side of the road, you know, taking a week, piss, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Brian, pull over. I want to, I want to straighten this out now. I want to talk to Trace. He goes, no, 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 just leave it alone. Well, we're supposed to work an angle against uh, mm -hmm. White Boy and Tracy. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this until I'm not going to get in the ring with this guy if he's, if he's out of his mind. So we keep going, and then we see rock and roll, and then they pass us on the road. And I said, Brian, blink your lights, pull them over. So Brian blinks his lights, pull them over. Now, as we pull over, Rick, <laughs> Ricky's driving. And it's driving. pitch black dark. Yeah, it's on the side of the road now, okay? A two-lane, a two-lane. Two, well, it's like, yeah, two lanes over here and two lanes over here, right? Okay. Okay, and uh, Tracy's in the back with his knee up. He had hurt his knee that night or ankle or whatever it was. Well, Ricky gets out, <laughs> Robert gets out, and Tracy sees me get out. And he goes, oh, God, and he tries to get the seat up and all this stuff. He's going to get out. And he's going to come over to me and say, I'll kick your ass, push it out, take that karate, I'll stick it up your ass, you son of a And he's pointing all this stuff. I said, Tracy, what's wrong with you? Calm down. Oh, you, want talk, calm, you, you, want, you want to talk shit to me? <laughs> throwing the punches and all the, 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 the <laughs> you know, he's not hitting me, but he's throwing the jabs. I'm going, God. And I looked at Ricky. I said, thanks, Ricky. And he says, the hell well, he says something else and pushed me. I threw a beer bottle at him, missed him by a mile. Missed Ricky by a mile. I couldn't hit the side of a barn. But anyway, so finally, uh, Tracy and me wind up in front of our cars, you know? And Ricky and Robert and Brian are, are milling around. I don't know what they were doing, but later found out that there were some girls who stopped to find out what's going on. You see the bleach blonde, you know, Brian mm -hmm. Lee and Ricky Morton. And Ricky said some choice words to them, and they went on. So about that time, as me and Tracy are having words, we go like we're locking up. And it's like the thing where I said one guy doesn't want to fight and the other guy's glad. Yeah. And I don't know which one I was, but I didn't want yeah. to fight, and I was glad he didn't want to fight. Because he, if he wanted to fight, you're going to hit some. You're going to hit me. Yeah. You're going to knock me out. You're going to kick me into balls. You're going to do something. He didn't want to do that. He, it was a lockup. It was a working lockup. And I went, oh, man. Thank God. But at that time, seriously, it was all like a Keystone Cops movie. We heard, we saw the blue lights. I don't know if he put the the siren like a blip or anything on there because what the hell y'all doing? Tracy says, "Listen, <laughs> you got kids, I got kids. We can't go to jail tonight." What? Okay, <laughs> so we so we went up. We said, "Officer, we just wrestled down the road here, and we we thought about some spots to to try on the side of the road. We just want to pull over and try them. We're just playing around." She says, "Well, you don't do that in my county. You got 15 seconds to get out of here, or all y'all going to jail." So, yeah. Yes, sir. We got in the car and rode back to Knoxville. I called Cornet and told him, I said, I'm not getting in the ring with him. He's going to be like that. And she went, oh, God. So we had promos in Morristown the next day. I got there early. I went and sat in the babyface locker room for Tracy to come in because they were doing promos first. So when Tracy finally came in, he came and goes, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I love you and hug me and all that stuff. Because you know how Tracy <laughs> could be. That's what I mean. It was like if you wanted to fight me, if he was that mad. But he just, he was Tracy. He He had that. Uh, those moments, you know, but, yeah, but Tracy, he was nuts. <clears throat> Tracy's not with us any longer, but he he was a great guy. But he yeah. had sometimes he had his eccentric moments. Well, who doesn't in this in this crazy? I don't. No, nah, <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway. Well, yeah. All right. But Mr. Tom, I I wanted to ask you about that. And one more thing before we go, is it true? 
as described by JBL, Justin Hawk Bradshaw, that you are the worst driver in the history of the wrestling profession. Dutch, Dutch, I think you're very well aware of Mr. Bradshaw's <laughs> prejudices and bias. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that, that not only uh, being the, the great Texan uh, and representative Texan that he is, Texas that he is, uh, he also has a tendency to um, overinflate. Uh, well, overinflate, but also accent what a lot of people say about Texans. And I'm from Texas. I'm the Christian. <laughs> you know, how, how everything is bigger and better in Texas, including the lies yeah. and, and the exaggerations and the, and the, uh, uh, accusations if you will now listen i don't i don't want to dwell and i know I, I i have a tendency to to drift off into the ocean and and, and i you got to bring me back in on on shore and dry land so we can you know get some substantial facts but here's the here's here's the thing you sir were in the car that night that that ha I uh, well I know what you're I know where this is leading because anyone who talks about my <laughs> my, my my driving skills uh, go back to well I heard Bradshaw say and then I heard Dutch say well now I'm gonna say it was a dead gun pothole in the middle of the road <laughs> and you guys are saying I drove off in the ditch it was it look look. Hold well, on. I didn't say you drove up in that ditch. I just amplified what Mr. Bradshaw was saying that you well, drove I, in the ditch. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I amplified. In other words, you helped perpetuate. So, the lie. and what happened in driving off in that ditch? You flattened the tire. Well, the tire became flat, and we had to get out in the rain. It was misting that night. It was in New yeah, well, Jersey. I remember that cold as hell, and we was trying to change the tire. And we couldn't change it. Well, now wait, wait, no, no, no. Hold on. See, I tried first because I was, I was in charge. I was the driver. I was the authority figure here. But uh, I, I, I was. And let me, let me preface this by saying I was doing my best to get us where we needed to be in a, in a, uh, um, a reasonable, respectable time frame. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going a little bit fast and. John happens to say, hey, I'm sure glad you're driving because I can't see anything. To which I calmly replied, I, I can't see a damn thing. Yeah. And then it was then foggy, it, very foggy. It was, yeah. So yeah. so I I went back and attempted to change the tire. And I came back with the news that the lug nuts were stripped. And then you, from my recollection, uh, and the prosecutor can can enter in however he wants. That you came back and verified my claim. That said, <laughs> said yeah, uh, yeah, we're dead. We're doomed. We're doomed. The, the, the lug nuts are stripped. <laughs> and I came back and agreed with you because yes. guess what? Who, who, who that would leave to change, change the tire would be Bradshaw. Yeah. So he got up there and he was cussing you too. He was even cussing me then. You yes. two stupid son. <laughs> and he actually changed the tire. And it was but worth it he, to me. But how did he change the tire if the lug nuts were stripped? He took the hubcap off. Touch. Yeah, that's what he did. He, he that hubcap was out. Had to pull it off. And yeah. but I think you knew that, Tom, because uh, I knew on. it. Hold on. And I left it to Mr. Branshaw to fix it. So you're you know, saying he's never he's never snapped to that to, to this day. This is the first time he's hearing it. That's a smart. That's a smart. Yes, I knew exactly what I was doing. See, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah See, there you go. You're, that you're smarter Bradshaw. than the yeah. average average wrestler. Absolutely. That's, right. that's yeah, yeah, John. I hope you. Yeah, looking back on that, that's exactly how this all worked out. Calculated in my mind. You just what had a you? birthday. When, when, when was your birthday? August. August 18th. Yeah. Well, happy birthday to you. Well, and you. you're 47 now. Well, I I'll, I turned 41. 41. Yeah. I saw I thought it was in hey, the 40s. Yeah, check this out. Check this out because I was I was with uh 
I was with the Godwins and the Godfather in Fort Wayne this weekend. I didn't realize Godfather and me were the same age. He's 63. I'm 63. And then I, when you get to that point, um, I remember Kevin Sutherland always saying he wanted to wrestle like the Sheik, you know, into his seventies and stuff. I said, no. And, And when I got to, when I got to 50, I said, I really don't want to wrestle anymore. I don't. And 63, even though I'm training these guys and, and doing stuff with them, man, I uh, I don't really have the desire to get in there with the younger guys and be able to do, if they would listen and knew how to tell a story and sell and get people involved. But if I can just say this real quick, I don't think, and especially uh when, when it was the, in the seventies and, and early eighties, I was, it wasn't about the hammer locks and the headlocks. I've never heard one person say, boy, that John Cena put on a hell of a headlock tonight, or boy, <laughs> that Wahoo McDaniel put on a, what yeah. a, what a hammer lock. That's yeah. not it. But it was the characters. It was the personas. And, and man, I saw the territory gimmick you guys did for Memphis. That was freaking awesome. Uh, but that was the characters. Those were the guys that got me interested. The funks. Uh, a lot of the guys from Tennessee came to Texas and vice versa. I remember Frankie Kane and Rocky Smith, the Infernos, uh, with J.C. Dykes and the fire mm-hmm. and the loaded boot and the whistle and the, and the flashlights and all these other things that nobody really considers now. It's not about the moves that got people involved. It was about the personas, the characters, the storylines, and the personal issues. That, that you believed these guys really were mad at each other and we're going to have a fight for a title or a belt or uh, somebody's hair or whatever it is. And there were real issues. So that, that is, is if people knew how to tell a story now, that's why Lawler can still work yep. at 73 years old because he knows how to get Lawler over and he doesn't have to do much. It's the little things he does. And um, that's what I try and tell people with our school. It's about storytelling. It's okay. Do they look at? Do they look at you funny? Like, what are you talking? Yes, but we but like we show. Just, uh, yeah, but go we, ahead. We, sh- we show old matches. We watched uh, when it first came out. We did uh, the study on that on the territory show that you guys did, where Jerry's talking about taking out Mario Valentino's eye and mm. and all these things. I said, guys, these are the things that. Even though, even though we weren't there and they may sound embellished to you, knowing the people involved, and I heard about another story where uh, uh, was it Dandy Jack who uh, Tojo and Fargo and, and Jerry Jarrett got took care of in, a, in another TV studio. I don't know if it's Chattanooga or somewhere else. All these other stories started coming out. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd hear from other people. And they would say, oh, my God, how, how could that happen? Well, it's because it was a different culture. It was a different, different time. It was a different, different era. Different yep. era. It was the outside fringe. It was people who didn't belong in polite society, so to speak, and people who would say and do these outrageous things. And, and, and you know, the nightlife ain't no good life, but it's my life type thing, you know. And you traveled in these cars and, and you drank, you smoked, you, you did whatever you did and you. Uh, you had fun doing it, but that led to what you did in the ring because what you became outside the ring was authentic. And these days, um, I'm trying to explain to the guys, yes, you need your, your high spots. Yes, you need to be modernized. Yes, you need to do all this stuff. But without authenticity, without telling a story, without having something interesting about you, You created Dutch Mantel. You created the daggum mustache and hair and the freaking whip and all that, all that stuff. There's nobody that can do that except you. I couldn't grow a beard like that. I couldn't do this stuff. I couldn't tell the stories you could tell, but people have to get into their own rhythm, their own flow. And they got to find out if they're authentic or if they're made for this or not. And some people aren't. Yeah. When I started in the business, like, old time promoter like Nick Goodless, you'd come back. He said, quit that, that damn wrestling out there. Don't yeah. wrestle. He said, <laughs> do something, fight, dude, get fight. on the floor, yes. Yes. get them up, get them up. But you, you have to have a foundation though. You have to know how to do something if you get lost. And I'm not saying because bruiser Brody wasn't going to be reversing hammer locks. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that wasn't his, what he's supposed to do. Jerry Lawler could wrestle, could do all that stuff, but it's the in-between stuff that made it. It wasn't all the moves. It was the facials. It was the pulling the strap down. It was the whipping. A, a prime example is handsome Jimmy. Yes. Handsome Jimmy doesn't know a wrist lock from a wrist watch. Right. But he didn't have to because of people, because he entertained them. He right. dance around to the ring, have like a 90 second match. His music would hit, he'd dance back, and that was his deal. And the people right. were all, all up and dancing. Well, and, and we watched, just to mention, hit on that too, we watched an interview with Lawler and Dundee, and Handsome comes out, he wants to be part of a six-man now. And Lawler's telling him, hey, man, you know, you're a preliminary wrestler right now. You're in preliminaries, which means you, you, you will wrestle down here. And then they get in a little heated argument, and Lawler's saying things that you can't say today – about mm -hmm. Jimmy's ear ring, and he's saying these politically incorrect things that, oh, my God, yes. he'd be canceled for. But but people believed it because it was authentic. They're sh they're working, but they're shooting. They're thinking shoot, but they're working. And and you're right. It wasn't – it was the, the colorful characters. And if it had a semblance of, of simulated violence or, or violence or something, just a semblance of it, uh, that was great. But But – the other part is what made it all come together. The in-between stuff. It was the, the, from the promos to, to Lawler riding out on a horse or Dundee wiping people out on the front row on his motorcycle. It <laughs> didn't matter. The, it was a spectacle. It was something people wanted to come and see because it wasn't your average person. These guys, you guys, were larger than life. And uh, Memphis was was a place where I, I saw the uh, the Gaga more than anything else, but it was Gaga that people were buying into. When you saw Dundee and Lawler work, they had these knockdown, drag out mm -hmm. matches, but they had chemistry and timing, and that's that's what a lot of the guys don't have they don't have the opportunity today because they're not working with, the, with I don't each think other. they understand it they don't understand it because they never felt it if you never, that if was never... in that yeah that was in the Memphis culture and everybody understood it now you're taking it from ground zero yeah. and trying to teach them this and they're not exposed to it well but... that's why that's why we watch old matches that's why we do match study and that's why we figure out who am I going to show these guys that's authentic inside the ring as well as outside and you know as well as i do dutch what we do in the ring is that much of the business it's mm -hmm. how you're perceived outside and that hurt me a lot because i was such an anti-social uh whatever i was i i i, I asshole I, asshole okay i won't go there okay. but, I, I but, yeah, throw, right throw the word in there for you you know right but i but i loved the business and i loved what i was doing i was just socially awkward and i had a lot of issues uh <laughs> that i look back on and and again we can look at but but to watch film study, we watch a match, and it's a great match, but it, it can't be done today. Harley Race versus Terry Funk in Houston, 1977. It's 45 minutes, two out of three falls. But they tell a simple story. It was the main event back then, but it, 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 it couldn't be done by anybody else because they don't have the mannerisms. They don't have the feeling. They don't have the, the – um, uh, gravitas to go out there. Harley race was Harley race. I like, I like that word. Gravitas is a good word. Yeah, I like that word. And the and the hubris. Aha, hubris. That's, that's another yeah. good word. Happy hubris. I remember him. Harley used to drive him around. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but but yeah, the, it, it is something they don't know. They don't feel because they've never been exposed to it. They haven't. They haven't had the opportunity to have see a match between two guys or a tag team. Rock and roll versus midnight. You had five guys who existed, who uh, worked together well, and, and everything they did meant something. And if you go back and watch the matches, and we have, and you watch, they really didn't do a lot. If you watch the Ricky Steamboat, man, Ricky Steamboat versus Randy Savage match, do you remember what the finish was? WrestleMania three, it was a small package. Oh, um, small package, I remember. Small, right. And I remember well, I, at, at that time, they were claiming it the greatest match ever. If you watch it back, it is so basic, 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 basic. And Randy Savage, as you are well aware, 
was an outlaw ostracized from the business persona non grata until yeah. until you know so you can never say never but there were some of these great workers out there who just screwed themselves however they screwed themselves some found their way back in some didn't but but guys like savage were authentic mm -hmm. guys like steamboat were authentic uh flair again right wrong or indifferent authentic there's guys that just you gravitate towards them because you say there's something different they're not the average bearer and, and we could talk all day about this. I mean, you can look at somebody. I mean, if you just went to a show and you saw a guy walk down to the ring, you could almost say how much experience he has just by the way he walks down. Not anybody can do that. And he used to walk down or, or see a move or two in the ring. You could tell where he was from because yeah. every different territory had different styles. You know, I had an office on the fourth floor, right? Yeah, and I know that. I didn't know if you knew that. I just want to tell you that. I but but I that. felt well. I didn't belong on the fourth floor. I wore my sweatsuit or my my sweatpants, my gym clothes, uh, my workout stuff because I figured I was a coach. Yeah. And then John John Laurinaitis told me one time, "I need to dress more professionally." So that was on a third on a Friday, and I knew he was going to be on the road on Monday. So guess what? I came in wearing on a Monday, my sweatpants. Yeah. He called the he called the office to check to see what I was wearing. <laughs> did he really? <laughs> he really did. And Ann Russo uh put the call into me. He says, You got a call on uh, one, whatever. So I picked up said, Hey Tommy, what are you wearing today? I said, Oh hell. He goes, I can make it to where you can wear sweatpants every day if you want. So no, John, I understand. And I lived right around the corner from the office, so I went home and changed. But then I had to get khakis and, you know, man, I'm not a button up guy, yeah. but, but, but that was what the fourth floor was. And they didn't want to talk about wrestling. Uh, they didn't want to hear about it. I, I would get the tapes, the videotapes and stuff, and I would review them and I'd actually call people and tell them until I found out, well, that takes up all your day mm -hmm. and, and, and you're going to see the same shit over and over and over. And, and they're not going to listen to you. So then that got to be where I was going to OVW and HWA. And then I started going back to TVs. So I was only in the office, maybe, maybe one day a week. I was doing voiceovers. I was doing a lot of stuff there, but then I realized you couldn't say belt. You couldn't say a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and they would stop me down on voiceovers. And I didn't know, man, I, I'm not, I found it's out. Not even the, it's not even the wrestling business. No, it's not. And I, and they I had have to, the lingo is totally foreign. If, if you're in the business, you're going to say belt and title shots and this and that and the other and blah, blah, blah. No, don't say that. Don't say that. And they have a list there. I heard, I've heard of words you cannot say. Well, period. I never, yeah, I never saw the list. I just know. I remember going in with Kevin Kelly and, uh, I did some with Michael Cole <laughs> Michael Cole. Well, Michael Cole and Gorilla Monsoon. Gorilla was giving me shit the whole time. I mean, just hammering me. And and I I don't think Gorilla cared for me too much. But uh if you were a smaller guy at that time, yeah. Um, and I I was again, I, I'd never really planned to I just never believed in in uh in anything i was i was it was until after i stopped wrestling let me ask you this and we didn't cover this but let's cover it now you want me to record the it <laughs> yeah you're still recording right uh i stopped briefly Good. and i've started recording again if you want to Go ahead. yeah okay. yeah i, I want to ask him about i want to ask him about vince okay okay so can you put him back on my screen james uh he has to speak it's automatic oh am i oh, okay. hello hello Okay. Well, well, he's not on my screen. Okay. Maybe he has to speak a bit, like a few, a sentence, maybe. Maybe a sentence. There we go. Uh, concern. There, uh, he is. there we go. Cool. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. Vince McMahon, in the last couple of months, did you expect that? Or do you expect something big uh, that was going to happen within the family and within the company? that resulted in 
the the organization as we see it today? Never. I did not expect it. Really? Really. Um, let me say this. I think... Can we and, quote you on this? Sure you can. <laughs> quote me on anything you want. Okay. Uh, but, 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 but let me explain it like this, and I think you can certainly relate, because uh, I... You've been around longer than I have. You've seen more things than I've seen, not just in the wrestling business, but you you study the news, you study the trends, you study the the odds and ends and things like that. That's why it's it's all. It was always interesting going on a trip with with someone who could talk about something other than. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, from what I observed. In my time in the wrestling business, I've I have I have seen some pretty smart people. I thought from from Paul Bosch, who I broke in with, yeah, smart man. Bill Watts, oh my gosh! And looking back on Bill Watts, hindsight being twenty twenty, what a smart man! And he's he's looking for talent constantly and to give you an opportunity. Uh, the one I was disappointed in the most was Mike LaBelle, but that's a whole different story. But Vince McMahon, of all the people, was beyond a shadow of a doubt the smartest, the coolest. I've seen him angry, mm -hmm. uh, but but he could be empathetic sympathetic and ruthless and cutthroat all at the same time. But I, I chalked that up to being in business and I chalked that up to, to what I've also learned uh, through Bruce. Bruce mm -hmm. learned a lot from Vince, but never would, did I think we would see a day when Vince wouldn't be, uh, going to work, sitting at the desk or behind his desk, not sitting there, but behind his desk working. I think it happens, and I've heard this said before, most people who are that successful have these ferocious appetites, not just for food, but for life and living, and there's not enough hours in the day to get it all in. And I've always heard that that Vince didn't want to slow down. There's too many things he wanted to do. So however this came up and people became aware of it, had to be leaked. Of course. That's, well, but, well, I'll tell well, you. Okay. But who leaked no, it? I, I know who leaked it. I think I do. Okay. Nick Khan. I think that's why he was sent there. Well, I've, I've heard that theory, but but how if if it's so obvious and how how did it? They can't prove it, right? <laughs> That's what I'm getting a, at. So how do you? How, I how think he was sent about? there because they they were expecting. Uh, this is what you use in world politics: a regime change. That's what he was actually sent in there, and they, they started cutting all this well, talent and cutting the talent and cutting the talent, getting it down, getting it down, getting it down. So it but would who, look. Who is they, Dutch? Who is who they? Who is they that sent him? Well, Nick Khan did it, and him and his people. No, no did but it. who sent Nick Khan there? How did Nick Khan get hired? How did who, he? Who get did hired? the hiring? Huh? Uh, did he take somebody's place or no? I don't know. I really I don't. don't I, I don't. I don't know the circumstances, but if Vince was the chairman, and I know you have people on the board, but how did you allow this? This. Yeah, but I don't. But they didn't tell Vince what they were doing. No, I, it, I understand. They needed. They needed this person in Nick Khan's slot. I'm thinking. But, but who is the they? Who is the entity? The board. You, the entire board got together and said, "We need somebody to get directors. rid of Vince." Well, I think so they had to vote on it, didn't they? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. So, so, but, but either way, um, it, it got leaked. And you can't forget family members. 
you can't forget the Triple H and Stephanie, which I, I would I would kind of push off for a while, but they knew the story, and they heard Stephanie took a leave of absence three weeks or four weeks before all this happened, mm-hmm. so she could just get get away from everything, so they couldn't tie her to nothing. Of course, I'm just I'm just spitballing now. No, no, I no. I, understand. I, I totally understand this. I've I've heard the I've heard these theories going out there. But what what I come back to is there had to be they, a leader, or that yeah, there had to be they had to be or a leader them. to start this. Yes, uh, yes, it had it had to get the ball rolling. Well, I think Trump did it. <laughs> He's, he did everything else. I think he went undercover and got Vince out. I agree. Uh, you know, it makes sense, perfect sense to me because he had a bigger plan. He was jealous of Vince. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. But, but no, no, no. He, on, on that deal here, it, it's, it's one of those things that um, – is it <sighs> – Look, so, nobody, nobody, no, 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 nobody's perfect in this world. And to build an empire, you're going to get, you're going to make enemies along the way, and you're going to do things that maybe, uh, you know, in, in a moment of of frivolous activity and frivolous, uh, uh, it, uh, habits. Let, let me ask you this. In your time in WWE, did you ever see any of this or suspect any of this was happening? <laughs> That's an answer. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> suspect? Well, well, I mean, we, we, could, we could suspect all we want, but did I actually see it? No, no, because the office, the office when I was there at that time had a, had a, uh, a pretty – strict uh nah, i don't want to say strict but it was pretty business like and it was supposed to be business like <laughs> gee what a fool i was right but yeah. but but um i that's why i don't think it was whatever was going on was going to be happening flagrantly in front of everyone at the office although maybe it was and i just wasn't in the right office or the wrong. Well, office, I have you seen in, in, I wasn't in the office, nor did I want to be. No, but you know, at the, like at the raw house show or the SmackDown, how Lauren Addis would walk through there. And I've actually seen him do things a little more than you think a boss would do. He was Maybe. a little more friendly than I thought that. He had a need to be. I didn't say nothing. No, not my business. It was no. the two, the two competitors that yeah. face off, and they had to work that out. So I figured, and I, you know, you hear things whether they're true or not. Right. You right. still hear things, but when you hear things in that environment, there's about a seventy-five percent chance it's true. Well, no doubt, no, no doubt about it, and that's why I say nobody gets to that position in life without stepping on people's toes and backs and heads and, and you get collateral and, butts and get and collateral damage. And yeah. Testicles and stuff along like the that. way. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> into their own thing, you know, so it, it, it could be when you're working all the time and, and you, you can do anything because you have the power, power, absolute power corrupts right and yes know, that's what to say that's what they say and and when you have absolute power in that world you can do whatever you want mm-hmm. or, or maybe you, you assume you can do whatever you want and i've never i've never personally witnessed it have i uh gone hmm before yeah i think we all have we kind of go hmm well i never went hmm i went like this Oh, deep oh, thinking. See what I, I mean? Well, that's a little deeper than. Hmm. And of course, you've you've heard the stories floating around this, that, and the other, and you know, Vince and the the, the limo driver that time years and years ago, and right, right. But but in that well, situation, in in that environment, 
you know, anything can happen. You're right. That's that's what I mean. So so it it had to start somewhere where here we're going to get the ball rolling. So when Nick Khan came in, as you said, just to recap, you know, and everybody started getting let go and all the things happened and Stephanie's taking leave of absence. Paul has his heart attack and all these things are going on and boom, and we're getting all the pieces right where we need them to be. Now we're going to drop this bombshell. Mm-hmm. Okay, It wasn't just then. The bombshell had already been. They knew about this. I don't know how long before it was re- revealed, but. It was it was one of those things where when I first heard it, it sounded mighty uh, convenient. Convenient. Very convenient. Yes, it just sounded really convenient that the the way <laughs> the way I heard things went down, and I said, "Hold on, hold on, hold on. This doesn't just happen. There, there, there were there was a mechanism in place. There were steps." Well, took. you know, they, they were so afraid of Vince and they was, I mean, he was the board. He was everything to get anything done. Vince yeah. would have to be like this pushed out. However, right. they did it. He had to be negated and he had to be taken down to where his nothing counted with him and they got him there. So yeah. but let me ask you this. What do you think Vince is doing with his daytime hours right now? I would, I would hope he's, uh, uh, well, I would hope he's relaxing, but I don't Mm -hmm. know if he's capable. I just don't know. I don't think he's capable either. No. uh, So what, what does someone like that? Who's worked his entire life? You know, you can only work out so much. Right. 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 Because I remember going to the town. So, you know, wherever raw or wherever and, my hotel was always where my deal. I stayed where Vince stayed. Right. I stayed where the riding staff stayed. I was ever hotel. I, I stayed there and they, and they paid for it, paid for my car. And they, they did a lot of, you know, because they don't, they don't pay managers that much. I had a good deal, but, but they took care of a lot of my expenses. So I, I just went by what they gave me right. and I would catch We would come in late. Vince would, and he'd be going out at two o'clock or two thirty in the morning to a gym to work out. And I went, damn, right. That's a lot more. That's a lot more hard than I got because when I see two thirty in the morning, I'm hitting the bed. Well, it was two thirty in the morning, and then we uh, when I was Dutch. I don't know if you know this or not, but I was on the creative team. Oh, you were. Oh, yeah. Don't. Remind me about creative teams. Well, what my, my, my point is we would have to have a meeting at seven in the morning in Vince's room, the pre-production meeting, meet there with the writers and go over what everybody's going to do in production meeting and rewrite stuff there sometimes and then head over to the to the uh, building or maybe it was eight o'clock. But, but it was spend those hours. We'd have breakfast in Vince's room. Mm hmm and then go down and go to the building and do the production meeting break, have another producer's meeting break, and then have another producer's meeting with just the producers and break and then go and tell everybody their thing. And I'm going, Oh my God. Oh my God. Well, how long was an average under that, under that uh, layout? How long was your day? 20 hours? Yeah. Sometimes. Because sometimes you get in uh, after the show, and sometimes we would have to drive, or if we're staying over, we'll go back. But yeah, it was good 18, 20 hour days. It sure was, man. How many, how many times I've heard this? How many times would Vince or have Vince have somebody call you and say, We need a meeting right now? Well, that's happened uh, twice for the meeting, regular meeting, but he called. He called me at home one time in Stanford. I lived downtown Stanford right across from the mall, Stanford mall. Mm-hmm. And this was right before the Austin match. And, and, you know, cause I was training guys back then and he wanted, wanted to train. And I had just come back from, uh, I think, uh, somebody was in town. Somebody was in town to train and we had just gone and had dinner. May or may not have had a couple drinks. <laughs> or whatever. And, uh, it was eight 30 
at night, hadn't showered yet, nothing like that. Vince calls. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking it's a rib, first of all, because I okay. answered the phone. What match, what match was coming up? Austin. Uh, Vince was working with Steve for the first time. Okay. Okay. And uh, he wanted to go through uh, the match. But this time he called me. <laughs> yeah. At, at 8.30. And, uh, hey, Tom, Vince, what are you doing? Yeah, right. This is Vince. Yeah. Well, I just got back. What are you doing? Hey, uh, can you meet me in about an hour? Or about the bowling alley? Vince? Yeah. Can you meet me in an hour? I'm thinking, now I'm realizing it's Vince. Mm -hmm. Why would, okay. <clears throat> so I meet him uh, over at the bowling alley. And he wants to talk about what he wants to do with Austin. Couldn't you do that on the phone? Yeah. Couldn't we do that on the phone? But we didn't. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to meet in person. And I'm thinking, well, well, this is great. I'm building a relationship, but I but I'm going, wait, what the fuck? This this isn't what? But that was the way he works sometimes. And then when he would get in the ring, we he sometimes he would come in, he'd stretch, and then we'd stand there. And then he'd look at me, I look at him, and I would just start walking, and he'd start walking, and then we'd start locking up, and oh my God. You know, he, he's he he he's not very athletic or work. He looks great, but not very coordinated and locked up, yeah. knocked the shit out of me. But he would do little things like that. Um, so as far as the meetings, when people call up, say yes. See, I've never heard this at all. Right. Uh, to me, this is great. So this right. is what people this is what people I think want to hear. Right. And there's no way for them to hear this unless you 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 give it. Unless you lived it. Unless you did oh, yeah. it. And, and 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 that's why I said I it was a I thought it was a rib, but no, he this is what he is. He was that involved in it and he wanted to go over and and I'm trying to think of something to tell him, but I don't know what to tell him. Yeah. Okay. Why wouldn't why wouldn't you call Steve? Well, at this time of night, at this time of whatever he's thinking and he wants to go over something, he has an idea. And I don't remember what he was telling me about the idea because the next day we got in the ring and we just kind of worked around again. And um, he was going to get juice too. That's what it was too. I remember yeah. talking about the the, the gimmick. <laughs> and he says, I need you to do it for me. Well, okay. Well, I know I made Vince's first blade. Yeah. Yeah. So, but he didn't need it because he got cracked open with the chair or something else during the match. Cause he says, I said, how, how did it go? He goes, I didn't need it. And I went back to see him. He got, he got the juice. He actually got a hard way yeah. uh, in the match with Austin. Uh, but, but you think, uh, knowing Austin, it was intended. Well, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who really knows? I mean, knowing Austin. Yes. Only Austin again, it, knows. It, yeah. yeah. That's my point. Hey, I'm so sorry. Hey, you okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah boy, I, I slipped. But uh, yeah, you, you, know, you so moved, you moved. Oh, I yeah. love that. You, yeah. you moved. Yeah. So, uh, so you went yeah. back to see him and what? Uh, no, he just, I said, well, how, how did you do? He goes, I, I didn't need it. And he showed me that on top of his head and yeah. he got the hard way. So, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was that kind of deal. But, uh, during the practices, during the training, he was, a different Vince than when he's up there and he's being yeah. authority Vince. So I could, I could feel that. And he had a was way of he, making Was he, okay. Was he receptive to advice? Yeah. Yeah. He okay. was receptive to advice. He sure was. And we would go over the match and, and uh, I don't remember everything we did in it. I remember when the cage match came up and he wanted to practice going off, uh, the cage and come, uh, coming off the cage on onto the the announce table. We yeah. measured it out at the studio, and he took the bump off onto the. Uh, we had stacks of crash pads mm -hmm. stacked up, and if you remember, when he comes off during the match, he lands on the edge of the table, and he hurt himself. Yeah, in practice, he did it, I think, three times right in the middle 
Uh, but in 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 the match, he landed on the edge and hurt himself. So uh, how badly? He had a bruise. Had a bruise yeah. on his back. Yeah. And uh, how he, old was Vince? How old was Vince then? Good lord. Uh, I, uh, late fifties, sixties. I, I had well fifty at least. I think or late, late. Gosh, when did Austin? He was about fifty three, something around there. Fifty two, fifty three. Maybe. Yeah, because that was 97, 98, 99. Oh, gosh. So, 99, I was 39, 40. So, he was 50-something, yeah. yeah he would have, uh, sorry for butting in, he would have turned 53 as well. Can, okay. can I can I ask this? Because I know, sorry, I know Dutch is doing the hosting, but I've got to ask. With Vince McMahon, you are the trainer of Vince McMahon to face Austin. Could you not ever teach him no matter how hard you tried to either take or give a stone cold stunner because he's taken no. a million of them and he cannot do them no it's just some people don't have that coordination all it is is just going down and up but no no it's it's vince and who are you going to tell vince <laughs> what are you going to say to vince uh except do it this way okay boom and he does it his way so yeah okay great who was the producer for uh, Vince and Austin. I had to be Pat. It had to be Vince, Vince and Pat and Austin. I'm uh -huh. sure they did. Yeah, that they they and I, and I remember I I remember coming back right before to give Vince his gimmick, and Steve had walked in and just went over it and says, "Okay, remember when we do this, 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 and this?" And Vince is going, "Yep, yep, uh huh, okay, good. Where am I putting this?" And I, uh, we put it, I, I believe we put it in a, in, in tape in here. He had a shirt down, a long sleeve shirt. I'm not sure. I don't remember where we put the plate. Uh, but I just remember Steve coming in and making sure we're going to do this, this, this is where we get the color and this is what we're going to do. Right. Yeah, I got it. And that was all they said. And they didn't see each other uh, until they went to the ring. Hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How many matches did they have? Gosh, I don't know. Three, four, five. They had a few. You counting this WrestleMania? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so when you went to the creative session in the mornings, yes. Which one did Vince attend? Any of them? Or Vince attended all of them. It was in his all room. Right. It was in his room okay. at eight. He what? What? what Maybe say that. Is after the gym at two thirty in the morning. He was still being a uh, sweatshirt, his, his sweatpants, his, his gym clothes. When did he sleep? I don't know. I have no idea. Is there a possibility he is a vampire? It is, and he, a and huge he does possibility. And he doesn't sleep. Yeah, there's a huge possibility. I don't know, man. He's just he's a different breed. He's like that Lauren Michaels. He's like those guys who are driven, and that's what drives them. They don't need food they, they don't need uh sustenance they, they they just need something to take in and absorb would you say that vance is one of the most unique people or the most unique person you've ever met certainly one of the most unique people i've ever met i met some unique people man i met dr jerry graham in la oh i remember him. i i've known i worked out with mark lewin when I was 15 uh, or 16 yeah. years old. So Vince is unique, but I've met some unique, interesting people. He's certainly one of them. And he's an intimidating guy for me, especially because I, I didn't, I never knew what to say to him, uh, but he would, <laughs> he, he would disarm me uh, when he could be nice and he could be empathetic and uh, feel, I mean, he, he's not, he's not an ogre. He's not a monster. He was never a monster uh, to me. He was a guy who was driven. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he expected of people. And you can't be the head of an organization as big as WWE and not have to be um, stern and know what you want. You have to have a vision. He had a vision. Okay. How many times did you ever see him go off on the writers? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> th there, there was one instance 
uh, I believe it was Nashville. And the only reason I can remember that is because uh, I was I had I was riding with some people. They were, they were riding with me. Let me say that. And we had to stay over after the show because the show was a, something happened in the middle, and then something happened in the end, and and he was hot about it. So now we have to have a meeting after the show post. And uh, I don't know if he went off, but he was he was angry, agitated, agitated. agitated. Thank you. He was agitated. He wanted to know why. <laughs> and I believe Brian Gerwitz was there and sitting next to Michael, and both of them were explaining why because it was their segment, I think. Um, and he Brian Brian Gerwitz was was very good at what he did too. He really was as far as writing, putting things in place. And understanding how it fit into the show, and uh, I, I think he was a very talented guy. And they, and Brian, and, and everything Vince would throw at Brian, Brian had something to throw back. But you know, I've seen him agitated, and, but not necessarily go off. I mean, how stern did he get? Did he raise his voice? I don't. I don't know if it was necessarily raising his voice as so, much as he was looking for an answer and he wasn't getting what he wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's place this in context. A, a Jim Cornette going off an explosion. It didn't match events. I mean, uh, Vince Not McMahon even. didn't match. Didn't match Cornettes. No. Didn't match Jim Cornette. Uh, you know, and I saw Cornette one time. Uh, which, which again, we and I, I have nothing but love, admiration, respect for Jim Cornette. We all know that. So, but whatever, but. whatever clip, well, let me say, whatever <laughs> clip you play, uh, I saw Jim in, in a meeting one time. Uh, it was in a production meeting. Everybody was coming in, and I think it'd been a long night and traveling, get in there, and Jimmy's kind of sleeping. And uh, Blackjack Lanza did something. Um, and and Jimmy woke up and I just said, "Yeah, listen, you son of bitches, you mother effers, and I'll, I'll kill every one of you in front of everybody, in front of Vince and everybody." And Vince didn't say a word. He knew he knew Jimmy was high strung. He knew Jimmy was was about had it with everything, and he, they were poking the bear. And, and I think Vince recognized it, didn't say anything. But you know, again, every time Cornet went off, uh, he had a he had a valid reason. It, it and it, I would say in his head, but when he wanted something done, he wanted something done the way he wanted it. And if it deviated, well, then he he expected it to to go right, and and there was no no excuse, no explanation. But once again, he's driven, and that's what he wanted. So that's just, that's the way he got it over. Well, how much did you think Triple H, he had to learn everything from Vince? And he had to spend a lot of time with Vince outside a wrestling environment. Yeah. So do you think Vince transferred most of his knowledge to Triple H or no? Well, I, I think Triple H learned a lot from Vince, but I also think Hunter is a student of the game. I really do. I think he's an old school guy deep down. I think he appreciates the old school. He knows it's new school. He knows you have to have uh, a lot of sizzle with the steak. Mm -hmm. But I also think Hunter did learn a lot of Vince's mannerisms, a lot of his uh, uh, a lot of the way Vince did things. Vince uh, Hunter took from from him no so, doubt okay when vince took over from his father vince senior they had an old way of doing things even back then yeah and then vince brought in the new way to do it <clears throat> and i think that was like started by pat patterson and they got it rolling in that direction and who, whose idea was it the the attitude era I, you know what? I think that was one of those things that happened organically because you yep. had Austin, Mankind, uh, you know, Taker had been there, but, but, but now it's, 
uh, short and jive, rock, um, and, and and Sean was still there. Obviously, I don't know if anyone had one in particular. I think before the Attitude Era, it was a new generation era. That was mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, but the Attitude Era was Austin and Brett. And they were they were uh, coming still, I think, reeling from the trial and just kind of getting everything shaken off. It's like a dog when he's wet. You know, you're shaking off the water and oh, you're still a little damp. Okay, let me shake it some more. And I'll wipe you off with this towel. And now we got the attitude so, era. So what was your last year actually like in the office? In the office? In, it was, in Stanford. Or... Yeah, it was 2004. Uh mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. Yeah. So was you that was you, were you there when Vince screwed Brett? Yes, I was watching that at the studio, and when that happened, as soon as it happened, I knew it happened. I was there. I was there for the whole Brett Sean thing, and you could feel the tension. I was never a part of the click, the BSK, or anybody. I was kind of. You know, I was I was off on my own. I, I would interact with them periodically if we we happen to find myself, or if I happen to find myself. I didn't go to the bar a whole lot back then either, from the hotels. I was just mm -hmm. isolating, and but sometimes I would wind up in somebody's room, or everybody kind of wind up in, in in one place. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and and so I, so I, the heat you could feel it. Yeah, yeah, you could because it was okay, never tell ending. So when did you think Vince put all this together? Because Brett wasn't going to drop the belt, correct? Right. He had made that plane. He wasn't going to drop it in Canada. Well, yeah. And I think the, the other thing was he made it plain because Sean had said to Brett, to his face, uh, I'm not going to put you over. You know, you may, because Brett came to Sean and said, hey, I want you to know I respect you as a worker. I'll do business with you anytime. And apparently Sean said, well, the feeling is not mutual. I'm not going to do the same for you. <laughs> and that was, I mean, why would you say that? But that was what Sean said. That's how it was going. And it was an obvious separation. I mean, you did have the click and you did have the BSK, which were cool. It was fine, but, but it was a real, it, they were two real entities. There were two real factions. They were two, you know, that was when we talk about authentic, you had these guys hanging around each other all the time. And they, it was evident who was, who was making things happen in the flow. And, and just, it, it wasn't, it was what it was. It was, you know, and there always been clicks and there always been guys who, who kind of grouped together and stuff like that. But, but this was obvious in the tension because Sean was saying things and, and being obnoxious and going, uh, you know, going to the ring and doing what he wanted it was obvious it was good mm -hmm. but but it was Shawn michaels you can't deny there there's he's a once in a lifetime performer were you, were you there the night that the harris twins jacked up uh, in, in michaels the garden? in the dressing yes madison no, square we, garden we were overseas uh -huh. uh, yeah that this was i think i think it was overseas because uh, well, let, let me let me tell yeah. you how they k they kayfabe me on the whole deal. Yeah, I was there that night. I didn't know they yanked Sean in the in the dressing room and jacked him up. Wow! Right. I think I think Donnie jacked him up. Uh, Ronnie jacked him up. I think Donnie Ron. Kept, yeah, yeah, Ron pushed him up and said, "You next time we hear you saying something bad about us, we're going to beat the living crap out of you." I think yeah. Don kept watch, watch Undertaker too. Yeah. They were yeah. watching out. So well, they that, didn't that, have any they didn't have any more trouble out of Mr. Sean. No, but but that that that's how the Harris boys work. I mean, they're real low key, man. And if something's going down, unless you really need to know about it, I think they were just probably protecting. Well, you. they didn't tell me, and I was their manager riding with them. And they still didn't tell me. I learned about it the next day from somebody else. Right. They says, What did you do while that was going on? I said, Well, what what did I do when what was going on? And they said, you know, the deal with, uh, with Sean and, uh, I didn't even know about it. And right. they looked at me like you kayfabe and bastard, you know, you just, you're not telling anybody either, but 
but well, they didn't have any more. They didn't have any more trouble. Were you there the night when they had the final hug? Yeah, we were there. I was I was riding with you guys. We went to the Dutch. Hey, Chris I can't Brooke, remember back that far. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna remind you because I remember what we did. Uh, we uh, Chris and I worked at the Godwins, and Chris broke his neck that night. Uh, I was riding with you and John, and we went. Uh, I didn't even change. I just uh, we, we we grabbed our stuff because we were gonna go see. Uh, oh, what was it? Statue of Liberty or something, but it was too late to get on the ferries after the garden. We we're trying to go somewhere, but yeah, it was. We left. What a bunch but, of marks! Yeah, well, you remember seeing the uh, <laughs> you remember seeing Niagara Falls in the in the mist. I did. It, I do remember that. Okay, well, we stopped out and couldn't see anything, but boy, this is great. Like the Grand Canyon vacation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, we're gone. We've seen it. But see, that's the thing about working WWE. You've been all these places, but you hadn't seen shit. Yeah. They right. said, oh, did you see the this? No. Well, why not? You said, listen, I saw the airport. Yep. I saw the hotel. I saw the arena. And then I went back to the hotel, then to the airport. That's what well, I saw. Michael Hayes would get out, get up early sometimes and, and or, or late and go around and look at the town. You know, Michael mm -hmm. did that stuff. So he wanted to he wanted to be cultured. But I think the rest of us want to just do it and go. But yeah, I was with you guys. Uh, you guys on the night of the curtain call, we didn't even see it. I remember Vince was looking through the curtain, and I'm right there at the curtain too, and he was watching it, pull the curtain back, watching it. Yeah. I'm watching it the same way, and I'm thinking, I don't know if this because uh, they had just worked with each other, right? And and you know Nash and Hall were leaving, and it was Triple H, uh, Triple H. Uh, Sean and Nash. Paul and uh, Nash. Yeah, Nash. They're all hugging. And so he couldn't do anything. He couldn't discipline uh, Hall and Nash. They were leaving. Yeah. And he couldn't discipline uh, Sean. Sean, because he was the champion. The only ones they could discipline was Triple H. And brother, they, they disciplined him for like six months. But wait they, a beat, they beat him like a drum. But wait a minute. Hold on. You know, as well as I do, how that works. Well, you know that the work is backstage. And I'm of the belief that, <laughs> that, that, that Scott did go in. Scott Hall did go in and tell Vince about it. And Vince knew. But I never heard that. Oh, you've never heard that. I never wow. heard that ever. Well, that Scott went in and asked James. Let me uh -huh. ask James. James, yes. do you ever hear that? That Scott I, Hall. What, uh, the theory I've heard, or one of them has said that, "Hey, we're going to do this," and then the yeah. theory was is that what if they told mean, Vince wasn't quite what materialized in the ring, and it was a bit more lovey, 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 dovey than Vince thought it would be. Very well, very well could be possible, but I, I think uh, the the story was, if it means that much to you, go ahead. But you're right. They could have told him one thing and done another completely, but I don't think it was a, a complete, um, uh, nobody was, uh, there was an inkling they, that Vince knew prior to, maybe nobody else did, but Vince was, uh, okay, until so Vince, it happened differently. So you're saying that Vince knew something was going to happen. He didn't, and he may have been told one thing, and then they just went a little farther with it. Possible, yeah. But but, uh, but, yeah, but he he wasn't point. happy. He wasn't because he he's. I mean, you you well, can't you, still you can't slam a curtain, but he he just pushed it away. He was agitated. He was upset. Right. Right, but he knew because he had Patterson and Lanza and, and uh, all these old school guys, Briscoe, who were going to be upset about it. And, uh, and, and I'm sure it, he, he wasn't real happy about it right off the bat, but you're right. He was going to have to punish Hunter for a while, and, and I'm sure it was one of those things where we're going to sit him down and say, Hunter, here's what we want you to do, and uh, here's what we're going to do. Just hang in there and wait your turn. And thank God it happened because Austin never might. It might have changed uh, 
Well, it certainly would have changed the trajectory, but I don't know if it would have changed history. You know, uh, Hunter was supposed to be king of the ring that year, but Austin got it and uh, and made the most out of it. Well, sometimes sometimes things happen, and uh, you take – I don't know. I just know the history from there, so it seems nobody you know, holds that against but, anybody, so – but here's the thing, and again, you you had to have seen it throughout life. The work is in the back, Dutch. The work is telling oh, yeah, it, it, yeah, that's, it, it, that's where back. it's all done. Yeah, and and so th- that that's where. Um, so you're I, saying the time I took a dump in Vince's bag? That one time, yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the they, other time, they, no. They kind of held that against me. He did. He did the for the, the second time I think. But they didn't hold it time. against you when you did it. No, no, I, I had just... well that I was training him. At the same, so, <laughs> so, so, so who he would needed uh, the you. trainer? Yeah, he needs me. The trainer certainly would have dumped in my bag. No, it was, uh, um, you know, it was the other guy. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was Bruce. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bruce, not me. Well, <laughs> hey, I think I, I think the second part of this, James, was much better than the first part. Well, well how's part three going to turn out then? Do you think? Say what now? <laughs> how's what? <laughs> Said how well, part, how's part three going to go? Yeah. Oh, I see. don't know. We ha- we'll, we'll have to I've do got, this again sometime. Yeah, I've got enough so, bullshit that. that but we'll, uh, we'll 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 pick this apart, and when James will put it up in bits and pieces, clickbait. Yeah. Hey, it's what, it what I specialize in. Dutch, Dutch, awesome. Dutch awesome. and Tom Pritchard talk about taking a dump in Vince's bag. There you that'll, go. That'll get some clicks. Yeah. So I remember the time Dutch shit in Vince's bag and Patterson <laughs> came in and said, oh, my God. Yeah. And then he took a shit, what? too. And then Lanza <laughs> came in and said, who's shit in Vince's bag? And I t- well, hell, I'm going to do it, too. Let me yeah. ask you this real quick. I know you guys got to go, but. But the guys asked me the other day about uh, did I know about the, the Godwin setting a pail, a bucket in the middle of the locker room and everybody taking their turns doing what they wanted in it. Do you remember that? Were you there when Sonny was going to get slopped? Okay, Sonny was going to get slopped. No, tell me this on- story again. Okay, so Sonny was going to get slopped yeah. by the Godwins. And they always put stuff from catering and all this bullshit in there. So they put did that, and then they – they made an announcement in the dressing room and said, Hey guys, they put it right there in the middle of the room. So, guys, Sonny's getting slopped tonight in this using this bucket. Don't none of you son of a bitches do anything to this bucket. And everybody lined up. Everybody lined up. And uh from piss to spit to shit. <laughs> How do you get shit on there? You carry it from the to- that was oh, I didn't do it, but but uh, you know everybody, I, it was it was a big bucket and it was full, so that was pretty nasty. She got she got buck she got dumped she got slopped that night with piss shit. Where was this at? I don't remember the town. I've never just, heard this either. Oh, it was on Raw. So I think it was they, they it was on TV. They slopped her, man. She got all. all oh, it deal. was the real deal. It was the real deal. Wow. Hey, she wasn't a popular girl, man. She no, was, she wasn't. No, she, she was. Wasn't. So, but okay, James, you got anything else for us? Oh, I could have a million things, but I think I've taken up enough of both of your time. It's been a great conversation. I think it's time to wrap this thing up here. I want to thank you for being the first guest on Story Time with Dutch. And oh. your school is J and P wrestling. No, no, school. no, no, no. Uh, but 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 it's J P Wrestling Academy dot com. Thank you. Check it out. And uh, but hey, and thank you for letting me be the first guest. You know, I, anybody else can be next, but they can never be first. So I, I, I have that. <laughs> uh, I have that distinction. How about that? Well, and we talked. We talked about you live in Knoxville. The University of Tennessee is now number one yeah. in college football, and they got a great game coming up. And it may, by the time this plays, the game may be over. But Tennessee versus Georgia will probably do twenty million people. Yeah, no doubt, man. I it's mean, it, it, it's great. So anyway, 
Mr. Tom, or Dr. Tom, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like you to come back sometime where we can get a little bit deeper into the into the wrestling psychological uh, aspect of what these guys have to have to do to get in and stay in it. So uh, until next week, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Dr. Tom and I want to thank everybody that listened. Uh, this is so long and uh, we the people. <laughs>